So, hey, we're in, uh, as you see by the screen, we're going to be in John chapter 1. And we're just really going to focus on one verse. Uh, but it's a great verse. It's a Christmas verse. It, it really prompted this was the, um, uh, the verse cards that we hand out. You know, we hand out the verse cards in the weekend if you join us in the weekends. And so this <clears throat> verse card, John 1.14, uh, was the one we handed out this, this past Sunday. So I thought we'd take a look at that um, tonight and um, consider that in light of the, the time of, of year that it is. Also, I wanted to mention this um, as it relates to what Michael shared about, uh, you know, stacking the chairs and setting up the tables and all for the luncheon. Um, you know, when we talk about things like that, here's an opportunity to serve, something to help. And it, it's so easy to lose the connection of, of what's even going on. I mean, it's, it's, not, about, it's not about a luncheon. Um, it's about lives being impacted. And um, the, the ladies' ministry do two of these events a year, one around Mother's Day uh, and this one around Christmas. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, they fill this room with a beautiful banquet, but they're going to have... Like 450 ladies are going to be in this room Saturday. It's already sold out, by the way. It'll be live streamed. I mentioned that as well. If you know somebody that would like to watch it once the message starts around 1250, but the, the impact is is really incredible, um, and and that's why they do it is to touch lives. It's not like hey, here's an excuse to have lunch. And I mean that's nice, but but it's the eternal impact. And I, I think that I probably have kind of a uh, extra tender spot in my heart for it is, is because of this. Uh, many years ago, my, my sister was at one of these luncheons, and she was familiar um, with the gospel um, and, and uh, who Jesus was, but never dealt with the reality that she was a sinner that needed Christ. She needed a Savior. She needed someone to take care of this debt that she owed, so to speak, as, as the Bible would refer to it as. And it was at one of those luncheons that, that she came to Christ many years ago, and became a follower of Christ. So um, that's what happens. Not just that, because there's a lot of ladies here, maybe the majority, um, just like here tonight, the majority for sure are, are followers of Christ. And they're encouraged certainly in their faith um, and, and edified and such, but, but also people come to faith as well. So it's, it's a big deal for a lot of reasons. So that's why we do stuff like that. And John 1.14 kind of... Uh, tells us a little bit more about the why, so we're going to take a look at that. So um, this, ex- this expression, I-, I think you probably have heard this, I trust you have. Uh, if you haven't, we want to pray for you right now. No, just, just kidding. Um, but a picture is worth a thousand words, you've probably heard that expression. And it's kind of common, and, it, and it's kind of true, right? I mean, if you look at, um, if you look at certain pictures, you think, oh man, I, how could I even describe that? You know, I don't know that I need to. Um, you know, the, the picture says a lot there. This is one, not, not big enough to really get the, the gist of it, maybe in that screen. This is an old Norman Rockwell uh, picture, a painting that he did um, when he used to do paintings, and they would put them on the cover of a, of a popular magazine uh, in this country years ago called the Saturday Evening Post. And this was, um, in De- this was a December issue. This is a, a frazzled sales clerk at Christmas time. Kind of what Steve and his wife were talking about. This is the craziness of our Christmas uh, here in, in the States. And so this is her after the doors close, and she just sinks to the floor. And so he's conveyed that. He's done it in, in a picture. It's, it's worth, that's worth a thousand words um, right, right there. So true as that is, that, that you know, many pictures uh, are, are, are worth that, sometimes um, it's just not enough, right? Sometimes a picture is just not enough to convey what you want to convey, um, and, and nothing really communicates as well as words. That's why in, when you're um, in high school, hopefully, your, your textbooks and in college, definitely, um, they're not filled with pictures, right? I mean, there are pictures in there to supplement, but that's not all there is. It's not like it's 98% pictures and then 2% words. I mean, it may be the opposite or a different ratio, but, but there's a reason for that, and, and so pictures have their, their limits. So when you consider trying to communicate, uh, say, the concept of God, and then you just want to do that just with a picture, it's like, eh, it, it can help, but it's, it's going to fall pretty short, right? Um, and, and then, you know, it's, even nature is going to fall short for that matter. Um, it's, you know, nature, creation, it cannot perfectly communicate 
God and his character, because, well, first of all, uh, our creation, it's fallen. It's a fallen creation. I'm a fallen creature. You're a fallen creature. Uh, even, even the very creation is, is in a fallen state. It definitely, and don't get me wrong, it, it speaks of his creation. The Bible says that. Uh, it, it attests to it. Uh, it, it. It attests to his glory uh, and power and creativity, for sure, right? It, it does that. But it can't fully explain it. it can't fully explain the God who made all of that. Um, it, it can't fully express, for sure it can't fully express His grace and His truth. Uh, it maybe could supplement it, but it can't, it can't fully ex- explain it. Now, the Scriptures, the Word of God, much more effective, right? And the Son of God, Jesus, the Bible says, is the Word. And He fully declares God. Jesus can fully declare God. He can perfectly express who God is. Take a look with me at, at the first few verses, the first three verses, in fact, of the Gospel of John. So if you're there in your own Bible, uh, John chapter 1, just want to read to you the first three verses of that. In the beginning uh, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And so John is, is describing Jesus in a way that helps you understand that, that within Jesus is, is that full picture, is the full scope, is the express image, as Paul said in Colossians, of who God is, right? And, and, and that's why when the disciples said to Jesus, hey, you know, just, just show, us, show us Father God and, and, and we'll get it. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father right? It's not, I'm not kind of a sort of an example. I'm kind of close to, to what God's like. You know, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen Father God. You, you've seen him. And so the apostle John, who, who wrote this gospel, uh, he goes on to say that, that Jesus, the word, became flesh and he dwelt among us. He dwelt among us. And let's see, I've got it, uh, I got it right here. I've got it in your Bible, my Bible as well. But the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Christmas story right there. There's there's lots of verses that are Christmas story verses, right? But that's one not often seen on a Christmas card, but is a great Christmas card. That's, That's the story, the Christmas story. God the Son coming here to earth, literally, physically coming to earth. He dwelt here. Uh, and so, again, the text, the Word, speaking of Jesus, became flesh, and He dwelt amongst us. He dwelt here. That word, very interesting word that, that the Holy Spirit had, had uh, John use here, it, it's, it's a word that means tabernacled. And tabernacle is just a fancy word for a tent, right? So to tabernacle is to, to set up a tent, um, and you know, we won't take the time tonight. We don't have the time to go in this tonight. But it's definitely worth considering on your own some other time. Uh, and that is that that's very intentional, that, that allusion to a tent being set up. That's not an accident. It's like, oh, that, that's kind of a word that fits. I mean, that's, that's very intentional, as the whole Word of God is for that matter. But it's an intentional allusion to the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness, so on Wednesday nights, we'll eventually get back to our study in Genesis, and after Genesis comes Exodus, and in Exodus, you see, as God's chosen people, as the Jews, as they make their exodus from Egypt, and they go through the wilderness, they have a tabernacle, right, that God has designed and given them the specs on, and the details on, and instructions on, but it's a tabernacle, and, and that tabernacle, that, that tent of worship in, in the wilderness was the precursor to the temple. And the temple was a precursor to Jesus because it's all about Jesus. All of that was to point to Jesus. It wasn't like some, that's just kind of a weird thing. I mean, who came up with this idea? Why why a tent? And why? Because it's all pointing to Jesus. It was all about Jesus. And so, um, interesting. I I don't know if clever is too trite a word, but interesting that that the Holy Spirit, um, hey John, use this. When you speak of how he dwelt here, he tabernacled here. Uh, but the point is, for, at least for tonight, is that Jesus lived here amongst us. And, and so he isn't just for us, although that's great, right? Romans 8 talks about that. God's for us. And if God be for us, who could be against us? Love that verse. Great verse. Um, but more than just being for us, he's with us. And, and that's why we know the name 
Emmanuel, right? Prophetically spoken of Jesus. We read in, in Isaiah um, and then even spoken of in the New Testament that his name would also be referred to, Jesus' name, as Emmanuel, simply meaning God with us. And the scriptures tell us that. It's not like, oh, I, you know, to me that means God with us. No, I mean, the scriptures tell us that's what it means. The word Emmanuel, God with us. And, and so that's really important. He just didn't pop in, right? He just didn't pop into Jerusalem, make a quick appearance, and, and then vanish. He lived uh, amongst humanity as a human. He was fully, fully human. Which, by the way, doesn't mean that he ceased to be fully God. He didn't cease to be fully God, even though he was fully human. Uh, And and he didn't just look human. Sometimes people think, well, you know, he just kind of took on the appearance. He kind of looked like a guy, you know. And and, and No, he, he became, that's why the text says, he became flesh. He didn't just look like it. He just didn't, you know, paint uh, an an image. Oh, that looks like a, I think that looks like a man. No, he became that. He became fully man. And yet he was still fully God. But here's here's the kicker, which has always been fascinating to me. And I I don't know, it's one that will fully comprehend. Well, I was going to say this side of heaven. I don't even know if in heaven we'll fully comprehend. But in Philippians 2, the apostle Paul tells us that Part of what Jesus did when he came to earth, when he dwelt among us, when he became flesh, is that he willingly laid down his divine prerogatives and divine privileges for us, which is a huge thing when you think about that. Uh, and he did that for us because he came here to, to pay, of course, as, as Steve alluded to earlier tonight, uh, a huge debt, a debt of sin that every one of us has, right? Right. And, and it was a debt that you and I could never pay. We, 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 how could we do it? We could never make full payment for, for our sin. It took a Savior. Jesus was that Savior. That's why I love, and, and the light isn't on it now, but during the worship set, you've probably noticed, uh, hopefully on Wednesdays or on the weekends, the manger there at the foot of the cross, there's just a real soft light on it during, during the worship set, which is just, it's so beautiful. Just, it's such a subtle message right there. Needs words. Got to have more words to add to that. But, um, but if it's really, it's powerful, right? Just the manger there because it started there. But that, that was the end game. Not the manger, the cross was the end game. So Jesus did that for, for you and did that for me. Again, that was the end game. So yes, dwelt among us, became flesh uh, for us um, and, and did that because it was the only way. It wasn't like, well, this, this will be a nice example. No, it was, it was much more than an example. Uh, it was the only way for people to have an intimate relationship with the living God because sin had to be dealt with. And God willingly said, I'll deal with that. I'll, I'll, I'll take that upon myself. I'll make the payment as a substitute. I'll do it for them. And we've talked about this often in, on, on our times of communion, but um, it, it's Probably, at least to me, and to this feeble mind, one of the, the, the most powerful uh, analogies would be somebody that is, is willing to go uh, onto death row for you and me. And, and you may say, well, you know, couldn't anybody do that? No, no because we're all on death row, so to speak. We're, we all have that sentence of, of death. So if, I have, if I'm on death row and my brother Ross here is on death row, and I say, Ross, you know what, I'm going to pay for, for, for what you, your crime. And, and so he's got this long list, not as long as my list, but he's got this long list of crimes, so to speak. And I say, you know what, I'm going to tell the warden that, to let you go because I'll, I'll, go to, I'll take the death sentence for you. Well, the warden would laugh at me. He'd say, what do you mean you're going to take the death sentence? You already got a death sentence on yourself. You can't take it for him. You're, you're guilty as him. You can't do that. But Jesus is the only one that wasn't guilty. So he could do that, and he did that, and he willingly did that. And so um, justice uh, had to be served because God is just, that's why, and God is true. Uh, and, and so payment had to be made. So Jesus, the word, dwelt among us, as the text says, dwelt among us. So John, obviously, it, it, at least in, in the the basic sense there is referring to himself and the other 11 apostles, but more importantly, not just that. It, this would be all of us. This would be you. This would be me. This, this would be us, the fallen and the frail, right? The, the, the messed up and the needy people. This, this is us. This is who we are. And he dwelt a, among us. He lived amongst us. Again, didn't just pop in, make an appearance, and I'm out of here. He dwelt among us. And then... John goes on to say, 
that we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. Uh, and, and he expounds on that. He doesn't just say we, we beheld his glory. He says the glory is as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he's telling us it's unique. This is unique glory, unique to the Son of God, only to him, to God the Son. And, and when you consider that, not just its uniqueness, but just the glory of that, think about really what is, what, what is more glorious than God's grace and God's truth. There's really nothing more glorious than that. I want to talk about those real quickly. And so it's by the grace of God I'm not throwing this. There we go. Um, so grace. Grace is not just unmerited favor. That's a great short answer. If somebody says, hey, you know, tell me what grace is in two words. Ah, okay, unmerited favor. And, 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 and that's, that's fine. That's, that's not a, a problem, but it really doesn't do justice to, to what grace is and, and the concept here that the Apostle John is, is conveying, and the Apostle Paul as well, for that matter. Um, grace is, is unmerited favor that, that is just so radically undeserved that most would just question and say, that, that's crazy. I mean, that, that just doesn't even make sense. Because you'd say unmerited favor, it's like, eh, you know, just, I'll do a favor for somebody. Eh, they didn't deserve it, but, you know, just going to do them a favor type of thing. And it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. And so in John's day, a way that this word might be used is, let's say you had an ancient general from times past, general of a large army, and let's say he granted a promotion in rank, a big promotion in rank, to a convicted soldier who was, who was a deserter. He was a convicted deserter, and, and he gave him a promotion, and a big promotion. That would have been described, you would say, man, that was grace. That general is gracious, because that's just off the charts. It's not just, oh, that's nice, that, you know, unmerited favor. It's, it's not like he just said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to put in a recommendation for a nice uh, citation uh, uh, award for one of my soldiers. And you say, well, you know, he just is doing his job like everyone else. And we would say that's unmerited favor. But the contrast of those two is pretty powerful, right? And so unmerited favor, that's so radically undeserved. That's what Jesus is full of. That is what is glorious, right? We, we lose sight of it when we just say unmerited favor and think, oh, you know, I've done favors for somebody. And, you know, it was just kind of a nice thing to do, a nice gesture. It wasn't like I was paying them back. And that, you know, I guess that qualifies in, in, in some ways uh, uh, defining what grace is. But it really misses, I think, the impact of what's trying to be communicated to us. So it's, it's that kind of grace and it's full of this grace, right, as it says in our text. Full of that grace, not little droplets of it, but overflowing, endless flow of this kind of grace. That's glorious. That's, that's Jesus. And the same thing um, with truth, right? Uh, again, the, the text speaks of, of Jesus being full of grace uh, and, and truth. And so truth, I mean, we can go on and on with truth, but when we think of truth, we think of of somebody that's not pretentious, right? We all know, and I suspect we all, to some degree, at, at times, uh, different seasons, can be pretentious, right? Pretending to be something that we're not. And there's a variety of reasons why we do that, and, and, and I understand that. I'm not saying that's okay, but I get that. I, you know, the, with insecurities and all, we can be pretentious. Truth, there is no pretension, right? Jesus is not pretentious. There's no ulterior motives, Right? That, that's a big deal. When we, when we desire truth, it's like, I don't want ulterior motives. Right? Just like, why is that person doing that? You know what? What's the catch? What's the reason? And, and we have reason to be suspect because of human nature. We got it, and we observe it, and others have it ourselves. But with Jesus, who is full of grace and truth, there's none of that. Right? There's no pretension. There's no ulterior motives. Fully honest, fully true, nothing sketchy, right? Nothing questionable about his character. These are things of truth. These are, these are things that everybody desires, right? That, that's common. That's universal. We want, we, we want to receive grace. We want, we want truth. Um, also within truth is nothing speculative, right? Um, and it's not 
not guessing, trying to figure out. And, and that process is not bad, right? That's part of learning. We, you know, we, we hypothesize, we theorize. Well, I think this, you know, I, I think that, you know, if I'm building a stage, you know, a uh, platform, maybe I should use a hardwood instead of a softwood. And here's why I think that. And then we test it and then we conclude and we say, okay, here's, here's a proven thing. And that's part of learning. And, that, and that's, that's okay. But with the Lord, there is no speculation, there is no hypothesizing, well, maybe this works, and if that doesn't, we'll try this. With the Lord, there isn't that. It, it, it's, with Jesus, it's, just, it's all fact. It's, it's, it's always truth with him because Jesus is the embodiment of, of, of truth, and, and he knows real truth too, and he knows the real truth about me and about, about you, and, and yet he still wants you, and he still wants me, um, and, and so that's the glorious harmony of grace and truth, right? Because he does know, um, and he knows how untrue we are, and, and yet the, the grace um, harmonizes, his grace harmonizes with, with that perfectly well. So our text goes on to say, John speaking again, the Apostle John, we beheld, right? We beheld him. We beheld his grace and truth. We beheld his glory, um, and, and so the idea there is, is to, to gaze upon, right? Not just a glance. Oh, yeah, yeah we, we saw him. Yeah, we saw him pass by. Um, no, we, we gazed upon him. We, we viewed attentively. We, we contemplated. So there's, there's thought behind it, right? Um, and, and, and that's why they, and, and as should we, they, they marveled. They marveled at the full expression of God in Jesus, God the Son. Uh, and so, again, John said, we beheld him. We beheld him. Which begs a question, uh, which Scripture typically does. It, it, it often will beg a question um, to, to get us to think, right? Because um, the Lord wants us to think, right? As, as we read in the Old Testament, the Lord being quoted, come, let us reason together. Let's reason together. Let, let's, let's talk this through. So John said, we beheld him, begging the question, have you? beheld him? Do you behold him? Do you gaze upon him? Do you view uh, attentively him? Uh, have you considered attentively the grace and truth of, of Jesus and who he is? That's, that's revealed in him, right? And, and you know, he said, uh, that, of course, he said he was the truth in John's gospel later. We read it in chapter 14. But um, he also said that he was life. He was the life and, and the only way, right? The only way to, to real life, forever life. He, he is that. So I want to close with this thought that if you, if you haven't come to Jesus as a Savior, not just acknowledging who he was, as I mentioned earlier, my, my sister, um, same background as I did and through, you know, parochial school, we had a pretty good understanding of these, you know, theological concepts, but never came to grips with the fact that we were a couple of sinners that needed a Savior. So if you haven't come to Jesus as, as your Savior, but just perhaps approached him as a great historical figure, totally believed that he lived, um, that, that it's, it's falling short of, of what he came to do. He didn't come just to be this great example of how to be a model citizen, uh, but to be uh, a Savior. Um, but just uh, speaking of Christmas verses, uh, when the angel said to, to Joseph, you're going to call your son Jesus, uh, Yeshua, because, not because hey, it's a cool name, it's a common name really, but you'll call him that because of what that name means, because he will save his people from their sins. He'll save people from their sins. So obviously the word savior implies that he's saving and that people need to be saved. That's kind of built into to the name. And so uh, coming to him as Savior is so key. And if you haven't, I, I would ask this simple two-word question, why not? Um, th there's no reason not to do so, and there's 10,000 reasons, and certainly more, uh, to do so. And, and if you have, and, and I, I, again, know that most in this room are those that have done so, uh, and you know him as your Savior, uh, I would just encourage you to, to, to daily, if possible, to, to behold, to contemplate, to, to gaze upon his grace uh, and his truth. 
um, because it, it's, it's unfailing. And, and it can be, and, and it should be, it, it should be the compelling force uh, in, in your life. Because the more you behold him, the more you do what John's talking about that they did, the more you do that, the more be, you behold his, his, his glorious grace and his glorious truth, the more that you find yourself wanting to respond to him. It's not like you're thinking, oh, okay, now I got to do this and that. No. It's as you behold his grace and truth, as you gaze upon it, as you ponder it, as you contemplate it, you, you're prompted to, you just, you want to respond to it, Right? Jesus said, the one who's forgiven much loves much. And I've heard many people say to me, well, you know, you know that I, I'm not one of those. I mean, there's some people that they're, you know, they're, they're hardcore. I mean, they're literally on death row. I would say to you that we're all literally on death row, but in the sense that they're in San Quentin, perhaps. And they've said to me, you know, I, I, I was never like that. I really wasn't that, that bad of a, of a sinner. And, 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 and I, I get what they're saying, and, and there are things that you could say that they're more egregious. The net effect is the same, though. Whether they're these radically egregious sins or not, the net effect is the same, which is spiritual death separates us from God. That's what sin does. Big or small, it doesn't matter. Lots of it or a little of it, it, it has the same effect. And so from that standpoint, we can say that you know, all sin is the same, and it's not. It, it, it has the same end result, but all sin is not the same. But I would submit to you, I would say, and I've said to, to people like this, and these are friends and such, you say, you know, I, I think that there's probably um, more that you've been forgiven of than you realize. Uh, and, and I have found, as my journey has gone on through years and now decades with the Lord, I become more aware, uh, not in a self-condemning way, but I become more aware of my sin. I become more aware of those, those commonplace sins that uh, everything from selfishness to, to pride. And, and I thought, gosh, really? I mean, am I still dealing with this after decades? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, hopefully a little less, but I still deal with it. And, 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 and I realized, man, I've been forgiven and I continue to be forgiven. I, I'm, I'm being forgiven now and, and will be. That's why when we, when we do our baptisms, um, you know, we'll ask people, do you, do you believe that Jesus paid for all of your sins, past, present, and even future? And, and the reality is we need that, and, and he's, he's done that. And so the one that's been forgiven much loves much, and we've all been forgiven much. We've all been forgiven much. And so Jesus said the, the, the response is loving, loving him back. Uh, and so... You ponder that, you, you behold him daily, and then you'll want to love him back, and, 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 and you'll want to, to just, just brag on him. Um, this was reading this verse, and it tied in so well just yesterday. Um, just in, uh, no, that's what we've been talking about. It's not that verse. Um, okay, there it is. This is from Mark 5. Jesus speaking to a man that he had, had just ministered to, and he said, go home to your friends, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And I, that, that's great. That just, that's just so, such a natural thing because the Lord has done great things and it's, it's just such an obvious response. Yeah, just go, go tell your friends, go tell the people in your sphere of influence how much the Lord has done for you and, and how he has had compassion on you. And so you behold him, and he will be that, that ultimate motivating force uh, in your life, right? It's compelling, right? That, that's, what, that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, yeah, the, the, the love of Christ, it, it, it's compelling. It compels us, and it does. But you need to ponder it if you want to be compelled by it. So you stop and you gaze upon it on a daily basis. You consider it. You think about it. Man, he's gracious. His glorious grace, his glorious truth. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son um, to this earth uh, to be our savior, not, not just to be a, a good example, um, not just to prove a point, but to save us from our sin. Um, and, and Lord, to, 
even ponder that is amazing. And then to consider um, what it is for God the Son to, to take on this, this, this human flesh of bones and, and, and to do that, um, that's stunning, Lord. Um, God, help us to always be stunned by and amazed by that kind of love that would prompt that. The grace that would drive our Savior to do that for us and the truth that he is, that he embodies. And, and Lord, I, I, I pray for myself. I, I pray for my, my friends and family and those in this room, Lord, that, that we would often and constantly uh, behold that glorious grace and truth and just let it have that, that compelling influence in our lives and just prompt us and stir us, Lord. We want that. Uh, and it's there for us just to consider, Lord, help us to consider that not just certainly this time of year and definitely this time of year for sure, but, but uh, month after month, may we do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free my heart.